It's been 75 years since the birth of modern China, and a lot's happened since then. From housing to health care, everything's improved, helping people live fuller, richer lives. China has contributed to around 70% of global poverty reduction. Building friendships around the world. That's China's idea of partnership. Chinese leadership has been very important in bringing peace, security. From made in China to innovated in China, Chinese tech now leads the way. China has made wonderful progress in many areas of science and technology. From a humble beginning to a global economic power, it's a rags to riches tale. Yes, you can be profitable in China. We did not observe any country to sustain such a high growth rate. Ancient philosophy in modern practice. China shows us how we can live in harmony with nature. When China talks about modernization, it's talking about a green future. Five episodes, one incredible journey. Buckle up for the CGTN special series, Journey to Modernization, from September 30 to October 4, only on CGTN. Hello and welcome to the CGTN special series, Journey to Modernization. Over the course of 75 years, China has transformed itself from an impoverished and developed country into the world's second largest economy. What steps had China taken to ensure continued prosperity for its people? And looking ahead, what are some of the outstanding challenges that remain? That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Well, joining me in the first part of today's discussion are Professor Fu Jin from Peking University and Hannah Ryder. Uh, founder and the CEO of Development Reimagined. Let's first take a look at a video on how Lamping County, uh, once one of the poorest counties deep in southwest China, has uh, secured this uh, continued development and is taking on a new look in this post uh, poverty alleviation era. Let's take a look. Known as Little Siberia, this is Lamping County in China's southwest Yunnan province. At an altitude of 2,588 meters, temperatures range from 28 Celsius in summer to minus 10 in winter. Every July and August, this quiet land comes alive as villagers harvest their golden fruit, blueberries. This tiny berry has not only transformed the local ecosystem, but it has significantly increased the incomes of the villagers who live here. Lamping Back in 2019, the local government partnered with the local companies to switch from traditional corn crops to large-scale blueberry farming. Different growth models have been developed here that ensure not only short-term gains, but also promote long-term employment. Dig 武功
，希望我们的我们群众能够在，呃，不离开故土的这个情况下，能够有一个安定的生活、稳定的收入，还有呢，就是家庭能够一起的生活啊，互相这个帮助，这样他的幸福感就提升了。Everyone benefits from this comprehensive partnership. The companies, the local governments, and the communities. Farmers essentially rent their land to the state-owned company, which in turn hires the farmers and other workers to grow the high-demand fruit. After harvest and distribution, the profits are shared amongst the company, the farmers, the workers, and even the local community, which may receive bonuses. This collaborative approach helps everyone and helps boost the industry. All these freshly picked blueberries are ready to be transported through cold chain logistics, reaching consumers in major Chinese cities in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, all within 48 hours. Hmm, 特别值钱。你在这工作多长时间了？几年了？旅游两三年了。以前相比，感觉怎么样？现在感觉还好，比以前好了。嗯，生活也好了，收入也比较稳定、嗯。每年的话就两万多，所以在这里上班的话，对我们是很好的。照顾家也可以挣到钱啊。With the expanding scale of cultivation, the small berry industry is becoming a major economic driver for Lamping County. By creating more jobs and increasing the incomes of the local farmers, blueberries have become a symbol of hope and prosperity. This is just one example of the countless villages across China striving to develop beyond poverty alleviation. The challenge isn't poverty itself. The key is that together we can truly make a better life.、Uh, I went to Lamping、uh, in Yunnan Province to cover the story to take a look at、um, what's going on after this poverty alleviation、uh, campaign. We know that campaign. Uh, lifted out of、uh, more than 800 million people, you know, out of poverty. As someone, China observer, you know, seeing from outside, what do you make of this effort? So, there's no doubt that it's a very impressive effort. The UN has said that China has contributed to around 70 percent of global poverty reduction through、um, having helped those 800 million or more people. Uh, lift themselves out of poverty, and it makes China effectively the world record holder in poverty reduction.、Um, and I think what's interesting about you know your experience, for example, is just the diversity of means that、um, that, that has been used by the government, also、um, companies and people to come together to to try to to cut poverty. But we've got to remember that. In China, of course, that doesn't mean we have, the, the the work stops. And also, outside of China, there are still over 400 million people, in particular in Africa, who are still、uh, in extreme poverty, and they need to cut、um, poverty even faster than China did. So, how how can we do that?、Um, and I think there's important lessons to be learned.、Uh, earlier, you mentioned about that. You know, what are some of the experience? They are applicable to other parts of the world. In this case, you see this joint efforts by the government, by the farmers, and also by the market.、Uh, you know, the company, the investment with the technology, with the equipment. Of course, there is a profit, and then it is shared. So everybody benefits from such a, a, a cooperation. Is that something you know we can learn from, probably, for other parts of the world? I mean, most certainly it is.、Um, but I do also think.、Um, The point about infrastructure is also crucial. So if, even in your video, you, you talked about the, this almost almost as a throwaway, the supply chain of the cold chain logistics. Yes. Cold chain logistics. There's four African countries that have good cold chain logistics. Just four out of 55.、Mm-hmm. So if you think about, you know, this is a this is a province in China, if, effectively. I, was, I imagine most provinces in China have a good cold chain logistics uh, now, um, but again, 40 years ago, 20 years ago, just wasn't the case. No. No. So it takes a great deal of effort. It takes、um, it, it takes some creativity on the part not only of government but also of private sector and people 
to try to find those to utilize the logistics and the infrastructure as quickly as they can to make sure that it's actually delivering and and uh, and and, uh, and making giving a benefit. So these are, I think, these are important questions um, about how once once you can we number one find the finance available mm -hmm. for building that kind of infrastructure in a more in across uh, across different countries. But also, once you do have the once you do have those things in in place, how do you make sure they are productive and continuously productive? Mm -hmm. How do you find these new models of 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 investment like the like the blueberry farming? Mm -hmm. There, there, I can uh, add something to Anna's um, points. He, she's made very good points. Uh, you look at the government. You also look at uh, the private sector, the market. Now, we haven't been talked so much about TVEs now because we changed the, we no longer use those names. TVE stands for Township Village Enterprises. Mm -hmm. It's a big thing, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, for ordinary people to imagine the process in industrialization, urbanization is sort of all very urban sort of thing. But in China, do not forget, uh, 40 years ago, we start with the TVEs, Township and Village Enterprises, and due to the unique feature of Chinese institutional arrangements, the Hukou system, following uh, the big contract, which is a big uh, symbolic contract, uh, symbolizes uh, rural household uh, responsibility system. Then you unleash uh, almost an endless pool of labor. And when those labor combine with some form of capital, uh, domestic and international, uh, the very rapid rise of uh, township and village enterprise. Both of you mentioned about infrastructure, the importance of the role of the government. I mean, one, uh, I think, aspect to this poverty alleviation is about um, relocation. Uh, in Chinese, we call yi di ban qian. You know, you move uh, the residents or villagers usually live, who live in this mountainous area. I went there, I can see you know, people live in the middle of the mountains, there's no way for them to walk out of the mountain without uh, uh, today's, uh, say, highway. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you uh, reduce the poverty? So there's, uh, okay, this relocation. Uh, in Lamping's case, they relocate the people uh, to this uh, urban area in the county seat. Uh, it's a sea change for people's lives, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of sanitation, in terms of access to education, access to medical services is much, much better. Um, uh, I mean, how uh, importance of infrastructure? I mean, that's how is that anyway, in any sense, applicable to other parts of the world? Part of it is around the planning of the process, because people are rational. People are not staying in their village because they're completely irrational people. They're staying. They're staying there because they have some amenities. They're used to it. They understand how to manage the village. Whereas if you're going to move them, you need to be able to incentivize them to do that. So I think the point that, that, um, that comes out here is if you have built something that means that they can have a real productive life afterwards, that people are going somewhere that they know that they will be surrounded also by others who they're familiar with, or that they're doing something which is going to be still farming, for example. You know, farmers love farming. Yep. You're not going to move them away from farming. And that's fine. So, but, but really, but I think part of the problem in a lot of development work is when we're thinking about projects, we often, because we're dealing with scarce resources, especially external resources, when you go to international institutions to go and try and get money for new projects, you're having to really cut down as much as, and you can't really put a lot of finance away for things like relocation or you know, all that sort of thing. So it's about part of the planning process and making sure that there is enough finance available to some degree from taxes, but it can only be, countries are poor, you know, so they only have a certain amount of money they can use domestically. But if you can get external finance, make sure the external finance allows you to compensate people enough, but not just to give them money, but to give them a livelihood. That's the key. In the Chinese case, you know, we talk about uh, how successful um, the poverty alleviation program uh, ha have been, but the still, uh, you know, people are looking at possible potential challenges, uh, you know, after poverty alleviation. 
you know, how can you ensure a continued development of uh, basically every aspect of life? Mm -hmm. um, what do you see are the challenges, Hannah? I mean, so what we have to also remember is, um, is again, China's program uh, for the 800 million refers to rural poverty. Um, and there's all, of course, when you have people in rural areas and, uh, and if there is still poverty in rural areas, quite often they will go to urban areas. And so you can also get a lot of urban poverty. Now, um, again, it's really a case about dealing with disparities of income. Mm -hmm. Um, we talked about the, the villagers here, they're earning, what, maybe 2,000... It's about like, if, if you work in the plant, it's about 4,000 a month. Right, yeah, yeah. Which, is, which is a decent income. I mean, mm -hmm. look, in Kenya, our GDP per capita is around 2,000 US dollars a year, mm -hmm. right? So those villagers in Lamping are doing really very well <laughs> um, in <We> comparison. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, if you're looking, you know, China's GDP per capita is around 12,000 um, a year distributed. And so the question is really, how do you make sure that is con continuously balanced now? And that, um, and again, that's where the forces between government and, and, and private sector and community come in. You have to, at some point, really prioritize community. But for countries like Kenya, and others are across the board, we're still trying to, we would love to get to 12,000 per capita GDP. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's our challenge. Um, and we'd be happy to stay there. Um, but but, but uh, for, for China, I think that the, that next challenge is, is around urban and also around dealing with inequality. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Haina. Thank you, Professor Fujin. Thank you for sharing with us your observation and insight. For the next part, we'll take a look at the medical progress uh, over the past decades in China. Joining me in this part is Professor Fu Jun and Martin Taylor, WHO representative to China. Well, another important aspect of uh, improving life in Lamping is uh, developing better medical services with the help from the medical assistance teams from Shanghai, people in Lamping are finding it much easier to access to quality medical services. And what is happening in Lamping uh, can be seen as an example of uh, you know, what is uh, uh, like, uh, going on in even the remote regions in China. Let's take a look. <laughs> Imagine a place where 14 ethnic groups live in harmony and ethnic minorities make up 95% of the population. This place is Lamping County, located in the remote region of southwest China's Yunnan province. Here, the government is on a mission to connect the last mile of rural healthcare, ensuring that no one is left behind. China is accelerating efforts to provide quality healthcare services in rural areas. The ambitious goal to have at least 1,000 county level medical institutions meet tertiary standards, the top tier of hospital quality by 2025. Behind me is the People's Hospital of Lamping County. Established in 1951, it's evolving into a tertiary hospital offering a higher level medical services to this diverse community. Let's step inside and see how healthcare here is transforming people's lives. The hospital now has an upgraded management model. It provides training for local doctors and nurses and has created treatment centers for major illnesses. Over the past two years, Dr. Yi and his team has been striving for a goal to treat minor illnesses without having to leave the village and for major illnesses without leaving the county. 
呃，县人民医院的患者外诊率已经大幅的下降了百分之七十三点六。那么，二零二三年呢，在这个基础上继续下降了百分之三十二。那么，今年的上半年又继续平稳的下降了百分之二十二。To better meet the demands of patients living deep in the mountains of Lamping, the medical professionals began to offer free on-site consultations, diagnosis, and treatment to villagers through mobile clinic services last year. 二零二三年四月的时候呢，南平县委县政府呢就率先在南平启动了这项移动诊疗车的工作。那目前到现在呢，已经呃开展了二十余次的移动诊疗车的服务，参与的医生呢达到了四百多人，受益的群众嘛，呃要接近五万人次。那么从这个后来我们的去对比的情况来看，那么通过移动诊疗车的服务，咱们这个啊最边缘的这个村寨的这个老百姓啊。Now let's join Dr. Yi and his colleagues in their mobile clinic bus as they head to a village about 50 minutes away from the hospital. We, 呃，南平的平均海拔呢，要超过两千九百米。嗯，所以虽然在绝对距离上来说呢，到县城的距离，那么有的村呢，啊、呃、比较近，像咱们这次去的这个村，嗯，呃，也有的这个村寨呢，离得特别远，那么就难度就更大了。嗯，还有一个问题呢，就是咱们这个村民啊，都非常的朴素，都非常的朴素。那么有的时候呢，这个这个疾病啊，没有拖到这个啊，对身体健康影响特别大。他没有这个观念，嗯，来为自己的疾病做一个预防啊，嗯，或者是一个这个提出这个健康需求，嗯，啊，这呢，呃，也恰恰是我们国家啊这两年提出来要从以疾病为中心向健康为中心转变的这样一个思路。以前看病嘛，没有没有这个医疗购物车，我要搭那个车子去县县医院里面看，要排队，嗯，还要好多麻烦。这里的话就不用排队，直接就来看啊。嗯。然后那些医生下面追加上来，对我们的很好，给我们宣传了一些知识。嗯。就是关于健康方面的知识。From highly specialized medical services to convenient mobile clinic buses, we've seen improvements in China's healthcare system, especially in remote areas. Take this region for example, where average life expectancy before the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949 was about 30 years old. By the end of 2023, it was 70 years old. This highlights this amazing progress in China and shows how better healthcare access and quality can truly change lives. So, Martin, if you look at、uh, the video, the life expectancy, the average number you know, from 30 in 1949 to last year 70 years old,、mm. uh, what are the factors? You know, what do you make of this rise in、uh, the years of life expectancy? <laughs> First of all, I think it's important to say that that rise in China has been quite phenomenal. That increase. There are a number of factors that we can turn to to look to help explain that. With the development in China, we've seen the growth early on in the supply of clean water, sanitation, hygiene. The patriotic health campaign are very important in terms of preventing diarrheal diseases and other infections. Then, when we look at programs to roll out immunisation for children, other care for children, care for pregnant mothers, those are very critical and have been very critical. More recently, in more recent decades, then we see the, with the growth of the healthcare system, the impact that has in terms of extending longevity in life. I think it's also important when we think about that to, to think not just of health in isolation.、Mm. So health is part of economic and social development. Health benefits from economic development, but also health contributes to that. You need a productive workforce, which means you need a healthy workforce. You need For the future workers, you need educated children now, which means you need healthy children. So, health and the overall economic and social development work together to support each other and to rise together.、Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Fujin, obviously, the medical services or access to medical services and education, etc., is an important part of、uh, 
is a poverty alleviation uh, campaign uh, because you know serious illness can uh, basically drive a family back into poverty easily uh, in some parts of the, uh, the the country or the world. Uh, so here. I mean, with this life expectancy, it says a lot about um, the overall comprehensive, uh, say, people's livelihood or life. The number I have uh, for each county, you have people's hospital, you have a traditional Chinese hospital, you have a center for uh, kids and the mothers, okay? And at the county, they are all equipped with three ambulances. So imagine, here is the county, better service, and uh, mountainous areas. Mm -hmm. Now they have cellular phones. Now they have uh, vehicles. You just imagine an acute case. Get on the car, start to move towards the city's ambulance. Now, it takes less than half an hour to the two meet. So the access, well, within half hour, probably you have a chance to get you, I have, you have a chance to get into the ambulance. This is so critical. Now it's even better, you are, the, the thing you, you've been visiting, it's impressed me. They are not just uh, making response for a sick person. They are engaged in prevention. Mobile, so you, so even without knowing you are sick, you do not call me. Let's have uh, health checks. And when you have so complicated thing put in there with the institution to back up, the result is what you see. Longevity level has been dramatically increased. This is so important. Now, China is not just a, an average uh, country in the world. China is a country, it's a vast country. 1.4 billion people. We're not just talking about a city-state. Okay? Yeah. Without that invisible hand, very strong, robust institution, that won't happen. Now, like there's 95% coverage of a basic medical insurance across the country. And if you look at the video, uh, their efforts is really about um, to ensure a minor illness will be taken care of in the village. And uh, for this more serious illness that will be treated in the uh, county hospital. So they have this uh, you know, mobile clinic uh, services mm -hmm. there. So how important are they to the villages, to local residents? Uh, in such practices here? Mm. They're very important, as we saw there, and they're important for a number of reasons. The first is in terms of equity, uh, to make sure that everybody in the country can actually have access to healthcare. And one of the barriers to access healthcare is often geographical barrier, the distance to get to a facility. So by closing that gap, we're taking healthcare services closer to the population. A second aspect and it relates to the 95% coverage of insurance, is the financial barrier. By reducing financial barriers so that people don't have to pay out of pocket or don't have to pay too much out of pocket, it enables them to access healthcare that previously they would not necessarily be able to do so. And then a third, I think, which is, which is really important, and it's going to be increasingly important in the future, is the aspect of preventive care that we saw in the video. Mm -hmm. the, the future health challenges of countries like China are going to much more re require prevention now to prepare for the future. If we're thinking about the long-term chronic conditions, in particular the ones that elderly people may have multiple conditions, so uh, strokes or uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, chronic respiratory illnesses, cardiac, we can prevent that by taking action now, but also we can diagnose early. So having those clinics closer to the population to get earlier diagnosis, get people onto treatment more quickly, is really important. Uh, just a, a simple, simple figure. There's nearly 300 million people in China with hypertension. Only 35% of those have their, their, their diagnosis and their treatment and their condition under control. So that means there's 195 million, approximately, who don't know or who know but aren't see receiving the treatment. So mobile clinics and any action that can be taken to make sure those people know about their health condition mm -hmm. and can take the right actions, have the right treatment, is, is, is what we need to help prepare for a healthier population in the future. As a mobile clinic service, the new part of their mission is really to spread the information, to help people improve their knowledge about health, about your body there. Uh, so how important is, you know, the, the Dr. E in the video also talked about not only treatment, uh, treating this illness, but also prevent 
um, focusing on from treatment to health. Uh, so that's, that's probably the current stage or the next stage, very critical in terms of the national health. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yes. And um, the, the shift from focus on treatment to, to focus on prevention is so important because, as we see at the moment, 88% of deaths in China are related to the non-communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. Most of that can be dealt with by reducing the risk factors. So that means um, tobacco consumption, unhealthy diets with too much salt or sugar or fat, excessive alcohol consumption, insufficient physical activity, and air pollution. That can be indoor and outdoor air pollution. So if we can share the preventive messages around that so people know what they need to do, but also do early diagnosis um, so that we can get people onto treatment, that's really important. That will be really important now and in for the future burden of healthcare in China. That, that, that shift from, from um, treatment to prevention is also really important for some of the challenges that have existed a little bit from the past. So we see at the moment, for example, tuberculosis. Um, there's still a challenge to do the last mile to eliminate tuberculosis in China. China's made great progress. So we need early screening. And those things like those mobile clinics can be vital for early screening to get people onto treatment before their condition becomes too serious. In uh, this Lampion's case, uh, obviously, this is also, I guess, uh, in, you know, practice in many parts of Western China because, you know, um, medical resources in a rich area like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, yes, will be shared in, in mm -hmm. one way or the other with people in Western China, like here in Lamping. And so some of their medical staff will also go to Shanghai to receive training, short-term mm -hmm. training. So that's, how do you look at this practice? It's, it's very useful and very important. When we think about healthcare, and especially when we think about making healthcare more accessible and closer to the population so that the common conditions can be treated in the villages, in the townships, and other more serious conditions in the county. Um, in WHO, we, we talk about this being a primary healthcare approach, mm -hmm. so led by primary healthcare. Um, the biggest challenge that we see in many countries, but also in rural parts of China, is the health workforce to be able to make that healthcare closer to the population, it requires the health workforce. So there's a couple of ways that we can address that. One is having specialists and healthcare workers come from big cities like Shanghai and provide training and provide their own service. The other is to think of the healthcare system as a system. And so you then can have the remote access and use telemedicine to help support diagnosis and those kinds of things. That all helps then bring more expertise closer to the population, makes healthcare more accessible, and provides the foundation for a, a strong primary healthcare approach for the future. Uh, Martin, earlier we mentioned about this, um, you know, Healthy China 2030. We know this is a comprehensive campaign to mm -hmm. improve the health uh, of the Chinese people. Where are we now, you know, a few years ago? Mm -hmm. How much progress have we made? Healthy China 2030 is, is actually it's a very visionary plan because it recognizes that health is fundamental to supporting economic and social development. So it's very comprehensive in its vision, which I think is, is a great positive and benefit from it. And we've seen significant progress in some areas, the building up of the healthcare system, uh, the health financing and insurance system. We continue to see progress, for example, further reductions in infant mortality and child mortality. Um, so there are areas of of clear progress. Um, there are also challenges, of course, and I think some of the, the key challenges that we're beginning to see now relate to encouraging healthy lifestyles, mm -hmm. addressing those risk factors that I was talking about earlier in terms of t tobacco consumption, smoking, unhealthy diets, excessive alcohol, insufficient physical activity. And the challenge in that is that it's not for the health system alone. That requires the right kinds of policies and legislation for all parts of government. When we're talking about healthy diets, it involves working with the food industry um, to make sure that the prepackaged food that we buy, everything that we, we buy, has less salt in it, has less sugar, has less fat. When we're talking about tobacco, it's about making sure that everybody in the country can benefit from smoke-free 
indoor public places, for example, like we have here in Beijing, but it's not common in many other parts of the country. So it means that there are many children now, for example, who may be exposed to secondhand smoke. smoke. On a bus, on a train, go into a restaurant with their parents, in a shop. So that's the kind of, those are the kinds of challenges that we're seeing at the moment in terms of the next stage of Healthy China 2030 implementation. It's about working outside of the health sector on those factors that still impact on health. Of course, you know, China has been uh, trying, I would say trying hard, to improve the overall health uh, situation here. For example, the latest announcement by the government to allow these wholly foreign invested hospitals in certain cities, certain regions. Uh, Martin, I wonder how do you look at this recent uh, step? When we're thinking uh, and looking at this new announcement, you can see that that will perhaps bring in some benefit in those cities in terms of access, um, maybe in terms of quality. When we're thinking about the challenge of the whole of China, of course, then there are the kinds of policies that we've just been discussing that we've seen in Lamping County will be much more important in terms of achieving equality of access for the population across the whole of China. Let me, let me share my observation. Um, the direction certainly is correct. Mm -hmm. I want to say why should we spend a lot of time debate about directions. To improve in whatever areas, whatever human do, you need to let different sort of ways of doing things, or you, if you may, use the word the models. Let the model to demonstrate which one is better. As we all know, training will be very hard. You need to build your muscles. You do not expect to build your muscles overnight. Okay? To maintain is so difficult. We need time. So try out different places in different locations, sort of let different models uh, compete, and in the process, you hope we learn from each other. This is the way how you make a progress. So once moving in the right direction, pace the well. This is the way to go, it seems to me. Well, with that, uh, we're ending this part. And uh, next, we will take a look at uh, the education sector. Over the past 75 years, you know, uh, what China has achieved, has progressed, and what are the challenges ahead. Joining me in this part is Professor Fu Jun and Joan Quelch, Executive Vice Chancellor of Duke Queenshan University. Welcome to our show, Joan. Thank you. If you look at uh, this, uh, we talked about poverty alleviation, medical services in China. Another important aspect to uh, poverty alleviation is really education, uh, in particular compulsory education. Uh, if you look at uh, China uh, over the past 75 years, for example, in 1949, about 80% of China's population was illiterate. Uh, by 2022, the illiteracy rate has dropped to 2.67%. Percent, so there's a huge drop. Uh, so, John, I mean, how do you evaluate the progress? I would say it's the progress over the past uh, decades. Uh, I first came to China in 1981, and therefore I've witnessed the extraordinary uh, economic and social transformation of the last 40, 45 years. And uh, I don't think any country has improved its uh, literacy rate uh, as greatly as China has during that period. Uh, well, let's take a look at this uh, higher education here in China. You know, China has built the world's largest higher education system. Uh, you know, now, as many as 250 million people in China have a higher education background. About one out of every four <clears throat> employed people here in China at least, uh, you know, have a bachelor's degree. So, I mean, that is uh, in terms of the scale, in terms of uh, this particular area in higher education, that's really something, right, John? Well, in every country, uh, uh, an increasing percentage of the population have bachelor's degrees. Uh, but what's more important than whether or not they have been issued a certificate is whether or not during their bachelor degree education and earlier, uh, they developed uh, the skills necessary to be long-term contributors to society. And the, these skills uh, require, for example, critical thinking, 
uh, analytical problem solving, uh, the ability to work together in teams. Uh, these are life skills that are much more enduring and in a way more important to learn at university than uh, the pure textbook knowledge. What, what I think is especially interesting in China is the, the government has done a very good job of putting in place significant incentives to faculty members uh, to really develop their research skills, to uh, step up, to uh, respond with uh, proposals to uh, very challenging and formidable but well-funded government projects. And that, that of course, is uh, fueling and incentivizing uh, higher quality research uh, in many Chinese universities. Uh, what I'm slightly concerned about is that with all the emphasis on research and uh, advancing science and technology in particular, that uh, those uh, who are really dedicated teachers, but not necessarily cutting edge scientists, uh, those dedicated teachers may not be receiving the level of uh, encouragement and acclaim uh, that they deserve for, for their efforts. Professor, yeah. you were nodding your head that there's a lack of balance. No, 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 no. I, there, I, we agree uh, very much in a way. Mm -hmm. But the moment we take science very seriously, of course we should take science very, humanity very seriously, but do not forget about the philosophical component. Okay, remember all our faculty members increasingly so get a PhD. What is a PhD? Mm -hmm. A doctor of philosophy in yes. the particular field. Right. Philosophical thinking, ideas are so important. How do you get those ideas uh, mathematicized then into the physical world, into the engineering? By the way, uh, Chinese system, my personal observation is that we are now capable to train a lot of engineers. So if you look at a very uh, subtle uh, letter. Philosophy, mathematics, uh, theoretical physics, uh, experimental physics, engineering, uh, and then, uh, then you build your skill up uh, that has an impact on our human life, including social sciences and humanities. And that balance between the two is so important. On that, we are coming to the end for today's discussion. I'd like to thank our distinguished guests and our audience of the students for joining us of this special CGT series, Journey to Modernization. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time. <laughs>